thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thou have done earth as it is in heaven. Give us there our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those trespasses against us. And lead us not to temptation, deliver us from Jesus Christ our Lord. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. So, So, um, we're in Lent. I'm sure some of you know. Some of you might even be fasting. But I'm wondering if we know why and what we're doing in Lent. And I'm wondering if we're following some sort of idea which we should be achieving. There are various ways of going about Lent. One is to just, as most people do, just change your diet. So you go from a, a, a normal diet to a vegan diet. You don't eat meat, animal products, you're careful about what you do and don't eat, that sort of thing. That's one way to do it. The other way is to change diet, but then also to merge um, prayer and reflection and good deeds, which scriptures tell us about, and to live those side by side. Some of us do those two and also set targets for ourselves that we want to achieve. Whichever model you want or like to follow, there's one concern that I have. And that is that sometimes it just turns into a box-ticking activity. You know, I, I want to only eat certain types of food, and so every time I look on the ingredients and I tick, I've done that, and I feel that because I've been eating the right kind of food, then I'm doing the right kind of thing. For some of us, if it's, you know, okay, I'm doing, eating the right kind of food, then I'm going to pray in a certain way. So I will pray certain times a day, I will read certain parts of scripture, and I tick boxes. And some of us will, okay, will incorporate uh, good deeds and will incorporate all of those other things. And so my concern is, for many of us, it does turn into an opportunity to potentially do the right thing, but do it for the wrong reason. And that wrong reason becomes that I'm just ticking boxes. I'm just meeting targets. Anyone who knows a medic, and I don't think there are many of those here, I know he knows a doctor in town. Uh, anyone who knows a medic will tell you that the biggest disaster that ever happened to the National Health Service in this country happened because people are just trying to meet targets. Because what happens then is government, and the reason this happens is because 
National Health is such a wonderful thing at, at, at election time, where they can flag up and say, here, we're giving you help. So they'll provide targets. And for politicians to go out and say, we have fulfilled this, then the hospitals must meet those targets. So we have, you know, you don't have to wait more than X number of hours at, at A&E, or you don't have to wait more than X number of months to have a procedure. And so what happens is people are focusing on these targets, but not focusing on anything else. They just want to fulfill the target for the sake of the target. Not worrying about the quality of care, or the type of care, or even the applicability of that care, because you just have to meet the target. And sometimes that is what we do in our spiritual lives. We're given targets. And we misunderstand those targets. We think that to pray a certain number of times a day, or to read a certain amount of scripture, or to perform a certain number of good deeds, is just a target to be met. And so I am focused completely on fulfilling that target and ticking those boxes, and I walk out satisfied. Now, of course, we must be satisfied. Because these are good things. It's a good thing to read your Bible. It's a good thing to pray. It's a good thing to fast and change your diet. Because they all signify a certain amount of commitment and a certain amount of, of self-restraint and self-control. But is this really what we must be doing during our lives? If you read the first book of Chronicles, chapter 22, verse 19, we find, Now set your heart and your soul to seek your God. Therefore arise and build the sanctuary of the dead God. Set your heart and set your soul to seek the Lord your God. Rise and build the sanctuary of the Lord God. How many of us set our heart and our soul on seeking the Lord? You know, if we're fasting properly, we may set our heart and our soul on being very careful what we eat, or praying, or reading the Bible, or doing good deeds. We will, be, we will set our mind and our heart on those things. I will be vigilant and I will be careful. I will make sure that my heart is always focused on, I must pray. I've got to fast from I must read my Bible. I must do good deeds. But what I want to say to you tonight is that is not always enough. Actually, that's not really all we should be doing. That is only an element of what, should be, what we should be doing. What we must really be doing is setting our heart and our soul on seeking our God. It says here, seek the Lord your God. And it caught my attention that it doesn't say seek the Lord God. Seek the Lord your God. It's personal. Look for your God. And we often forget that he is our God. We look at him as God, which he is. We look at him as the savior of the world, which he is. We look at him as the omnipotent, omniscient, which he is. But we don't look at him as my God. Mine, personally mine. You know, one thing that is good in relationships, but sometimes in excess, kills some relationships, is the sense of possessiveness. When you're in a relationship with someone, you're possessive of that person. That person is yours. And it doesn't, have to, it doesn't even have to be a, a romantic relationship. It can be a platonic relationship. Your friend, you feel that your friend should only be spending time with you. You feel that your friend should only be focusing on you. And so we feel possessive. We feel that person must be mine. 
And if you feel that possessiveness, as soon as you walk into a room, what do you do? You look for the person. As soon as you pick up your phone, what's the first thing you do? Is there a missed call? Is there a text message? Is there an email? So we end up, because of this possessiveness, focusing on the person and feeling that he or she is mine. Rightly or wrongly, because as I said, it's a wonderful thing in relationships to feel that person is yours, but sometimes in excess, it actually destroys relationships because people with possessiveness also become sometimes very selfish and self-centered. What we must try to do is be possessive over God. He is the Lord, my God. He's mine. But the good thing about God is because He is God, unlimited, He can be my God completely. He can also be your God and yours and yours and yours. He can be our God all, collectively, but He can also be our God individually without any sort of limitation. So, during this fast, it's not just about going through the motions. It's not just about ticking boxes. Even if those boxes are right to tick, and please don't misunderstand me. Yes, you must fast. Yes, you must read your Bible. Yes, you must pray. Yes, you must do good deeds. But those are all a means to an end. What is the end? The end is seeking and hopefully finding the Lord our God. And then he says, arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord God. Arise and build. You know what's important about two, those two words? They're both verbs. They are both things to do. Arise. Get up. I, I travel all over the world. I drive all over the UK. I have no problem traveling. But sometimes the most difficult journey, and anyone who's around me will know this, sometimes the most difficult journey is getting out of my office chair and walking to my car. That is just the most difficult part of the journey. You know what? Driving here tonight, not an issue. Especially because I was going to see you guys. But sometimes the most difficult journey is to actually arise, get out of that chair. And once you've gotten out of that chair, it's done. And that's why we must, in this sense of seeking the Lord our God, arise, get up. I don't know if this scenario sounds familiar to you, but imagine a Saturday morning, and you've been working all week, and you wake up around, I don't know, for most of you probably about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know, you get up at a certain time, and the first thing that goes through your mind is, oh, this bed's nice and warm. And then what goes through your mind is, on oh, Saturday, there's so much to do. You know what? I'm going to get up, and I'm going to make breakfast, I'm going to spend time with my family, and then I'm going to do a bit of shopping, and then I'm going to go to the lawn, then I'm going to go to church around 10 in Australia, then I'm going to meet up with friends, then I'm going to attend this Baha, then I'm going to go out with more friends. Yeah, I'm going to do all of that. And that thought keeps going around. <laughs> And around and around. And an hour later, you're still thinking, I'm going to do all these things. You can think as much as you want. If you do not arise, none of that is going to happen. And so we must arise. We can have all the great intentions in the world for our fast, for Lent. But if we don't arise, none of that happens. I can always want to seek the Lord my God. 
And I think we all do, you know, deep in our hearts. I don't think there's anyone here who does not want to seek the Lord, his or her God. But how many of us actually get around to doing it? How many of us? That's the problem. How many of us actually arise and then seek him? And not only seek him, but seek him with our whole heart and our whole soul. So we need to arise. Arise is then that's just the first step. Because again, we're in here on Saturday morning, we've gone through this whole, whole process, and maybe three hours later, you're ready to arise. Right? I don't know how people do that. Either. I just, you know, when someone asks me if I've had a lion, I say, yeah, I've got a eight, maybe. But wasting a third of your life in bed is really not a good thing. Really not a good thing. But anyway, let's go another thing. Arise. First thing is, arise. But then what? Build. Do something. On Saturday morning, you finally got up, and then, hopefully you'll shower, <laughs> and dress tastefully, and then go out and do what you need to do. Because not doing either of those could be disastrous for everybody else around you. That's a different issue. Do things. Arise and build. What do we need to do in our lives? We need to arise from the slumber, as, as the prophet David says, arise from the slumber of sin. Arise from the slumber of laziness and carelessness. And once we have arisen, <coughs> then we must build. We have to build. What are we building? We are building the sanctuary of the Lord God. What's a sanctuary? A sanctuary is a place, and, and just the technicality again for you guys, especially the deacons, when you say you're going to serve in there, what do most people say? Most people say we're serving in the altar. You're not serving in the altar, you're serving in the sanctuary at the altar. You're serving in the sanctuary, at the altar. That is a sanctuary. What is a sanctuary? It's a sanctuary. It's a place where people find safety. It's a place of holiness. It is sanctified. The sanctuary. And so it is a place where we find rest. But it is also a place that is blessed sanctified, and is set aside for God. So when we are going to build a sanctuary of the Lord God, it is a place just for Him. So during this fast, we need to be seeking Him, and seeking to build a sanctuary just for Him. Where is that sanctuary? Sanctuary is my heart. Sanctuary is my heart. And it is set aside for him and him alone. Set aside for him so that there's no distraction. And I assure you, I assure you, categorically, if you set aside your heart for the Lord your God, nothing else will enter. All the things you run from, all the things you hide from, all the things you fight against, all the things you battle with, all of those will have no place because they just can't enter. They can't enter. Just to express this to you slightly dramatically and in a way that you might find, find it a bit weird, is um, growing up, Saturday nights, when you switched on your televisions, there was inevitably, inevitably, a Dracula movie. And it didn't include a bunch of 
hyperactive, late teens, early 20s, running around modern day New York, trying to suck each other's blood. I'm talking about the real Count Dracula, right? the, the old school stuff. And there was always this thing about crosses. What happens within the context of Dracula when he sees a cross and counts a cross? He flees, he can't handle it. Now, of course, we all know Dracula doesn't exist. We do know Dracula. Right? <laughs> Not even with the Twilight series, no that sort of stuff. But what's the concept? The concept of Dracula was actually the embodiment of sin. And sin cannot coexist with holiness. Once you show the cross, which is a sign of God's infinite sacrifice, but also his infinite victory, Sin could not bear to be in the same place as righteousness. So once you consecrate your sanctuary, your heart, to the Lord, once it is His, sin cannot come anywhere near it. Anywhere. Because it can't come into the presence of God. It can't come to the ground of God. So during this fast, we must try to build that sanctuary to the will of God. And we must try with every part of our being. And I want to reassure you of one thing. Sometimes we don't because we think we can't. Sometimes we don't seek him because we don't think we can find him. Sometimes we don't arise because we think we're spiritually crippled. Sometimes we don't build because we don't think we have the capabilities or talents. And sometimes we just don't seek because, oh, I'm not going to find him. And this is why I want to share Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Seek the Lord while he can be found. And call upon him while he is near. What will happen? Deuteronomy 4.29 but from there, you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find Him. You will seek the Lord your God. It's definitive. You will seek the Lord your God, and you will find Him. There's no condition. Any lawyers or ways to be in the room? No loophole here. No contractual loophole. You will seek Him. You will find Him. Clear, definitive, crisp. But there is something. And you will find him, this is the same verse, and you will find him if you seek him with your whole heart and with your soul. So yes, you will find him. Seek him, you will find him. But you will find Find him if you seek him with all your heart. And that's one thing we fall short on. We don't often do anything with all of our anything. Right? Think about it. Um, studies, work, relationships, interactions, commitments, responsibilities. We quite seldom do anything with all of our anything. If we're really good, we'll get close. And if we're really bad, we'll be very shallow. And if we're, eh, we'll do what we can, we're back average.
We need to seek him with all our heart and all our soul. During this fast, what must we do? Am I praying? Yes, I'm praying. But I'm praying to speak to him. And when I pray, I'm praying with my whole heart. Lord, I want to speak to you. I want to spend time with you. I want to give you my complete attention and I want yours. I'm going to switch off my phone. I'm going to switch off my computer. I'm going to switch off my entertainment system. I'm going to switch off anything I have. Because you know what? For this next 10, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, because we're all very different, for that time I am with you, I'm really seeking you with my whole heart. I don't want my heart distracted by anything. I don't want my heart wandering anywhere else. I don't want my heart seeking anything else. Even if it's apparently good, I have 24, 23 and a half other hours to do that. But for this time, I am seeking you and you alone. I am seeking you because I want you. And Lord, you promised me. You promised me, if I seek you, I will find you. So I am here. I am here wanting to find you. I'm going to open my Bible. I'm not going to do the thing where I open my Bible and I read a few lines and then I think about what I've done during the day and what I'm going to do that evening and I might do tomorrow. And suddenly all of this goes through my mind. And, and I zoom back in, and I have no idea what I've read. So I read it again. Then I start to get sleepy, and I start to get tired. So I zoom in again, and I read it again. And I get nowhere. I get nowhere. Imagine if you were sitting with your friend, and you were doing that. So you sit with your friend, and your friend's speaking to you, and all of a sudden you pick up your phone and you start texting. Or you start thinking about something else. Or you start, you know? What is your friend going to say to you? Why are you giving, my, why are you giving me your, your undivided attention? I'm sitting here speaking to you. Why aren't you listening to me with, with everything you have? Is it a lack of love or disrespect or no time or lack of care? What is it? And God does the same thing. Because in Scripture, we hear Him speaking to us. How many of us will open up our Bibles and read our Bibles while our mobile phones are within sight. So that, just in case Her Majesty the Queen <laughs> has a real problem she can't handle, and the Prime Minister is unavailable, she just has to call you. And what else is she going to do? Am I going to do good deeds? Yeah, do good deeds. 
Absolutely, do good deeds. But do good deeds with your whole heart. Don't go to city mission to meet your friends. Don't go to feed the homeless around here just because it's something interesting to do during the week, why not? Don't pay a donation thinking, you know, I, I can do so much with this five pounds, but yeah, actually, maybe just two pounds this week. Not even that. Good deeds in your own home. Don't be so thrifty with your time when it comes to your families and your loved ones. Be generous. Give generously. Because if you can't give to those who are closest to you, you can never give to those who you do not know. So are you going to those things? Yes, do them. But through them all, remember, if you're praying, you're praying to seek the Lord. If you're reading your Bible, you're reading your Bible to seek the Lord. If you're doing good deeds, because in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, our Lord says to us, if you have done this, you know, feeding the hungry, dressing the naked, visiting the imprisoned and the sick, if you have done this, to any of these, the least of my brethren, you've done them to me. So Lord, I'm coming to serve you through them. I'm going to experience you through them because I can't experience you physically and tangibly. I'm going to experience you through them. I'm going to meet you through them. Have we are guaranteed here? What is our guarantee? If you will seek him with all your heart and all your soul, that's the condition. All your heart, all your soul. Not 10%, 20%, 50%. 50%. With all your heart, all your soul. You will find him. So during this Lent, it is a time for us to prepare ourselves to experience and find the Lord our God. And we need to start that. But there's a misconception. Misconception is, I can do this, and I'll do everything you said during Lent. But once Lent comes, done. Okay, I can go with the rest of my life. You know what that's like? That's like having a very experienced and wealthy building contractor who says, for the next eight weeks, I am going to lay foundations for a 20-story building. So he goes and he digs, and he cleans, and he lays massive foundations. Looks and says, these are wonderful, they're so look, look, look how powerful they are, they're great. Okay, I'm going to go down. And he walks away. Foundations are laid to be built on. Not just to be laid for the sake of Lent. Lent is not a time where we just do things and then cut off and forget about it. Lent is a time we put these foundations down so that at the end of it, we can start to build on them and continue to build on them. Otherwise, it'll be a waste of time. Otherwise, so what? Out of 52 weeks, I have lived an incredible spiritual life, if I've done anything right, I've lived an incredible spiritual life for eight weeks, and that's it. It's not what it's about. It's about living that incredible spiritual life for those eight weeks, but then building on that, inspired by it. So during this Lent, I want you to look at it very differently. Look at what we want to do. What we want to do is experience the Lord our God and find Him. Not so that, Lord, I found you, great, okay, thank you, bye. When you look at something and find it, surely 
you'll find they get to keep it. You know, I could never understand these fishermen who go out and catch a fish just to throw it back. It doesn't make sense to me. You don't say, Lord, I'm so glad I found you. Tip, you're it. Walk away. Don't know what it's about. It's not just, oh great, it's been a challenge. I found my Easter egg. It's about finding him to keep him. And to continue living with him. And to grow in that relationship with him. And to continue day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, growing that relationship. So these are in the deep blessed times. They're wonderful times. They're beautiful times. Don't just make it about the food. Don't just make it about anything. But whatever you do, do it to seek the Lord your God. And fast faithfully. Fast valiantly. Fast honestly. In your food, in your prayers, in your readings, in your good deeds, in seeking the Lord. Do them faithfully. We do enough in our lives that is half-baked. We do enough in our lives that is mediocre. And it doesn't get us anywhere. We want to do this powerfully. So that as we said in laying a foundation, we can continue to build and flourish. We can continue to rise above the level of the ground. And the higher we rise, the more perspective that we get over the whole earth. Because we live with him. In our hearts, we live with him in his kingdom. So everything looks very different. And we can also dream and work towards being with him in his kingdom forever. And glory be to God. Just take a moment to put your hands down before. Questions or comments? No? So. Um, you said it was obviously a problem when, when we're praying or reading the Bible, <coughs> the thoughts go elsewhere, and then we, we, we zone back in and then it goes again. Do you have any like, actual practical advice how to contain the thoughts? So, practical advice about how to read in a focused way so you don't have to pray. The first thing I'll say to you is we need to prepare ourselves for those things. So sometimes I will run into my room because it's that time and just open my Bible and accept, expect to have been going on in my life absolutely normally outside with the comings and going and turmoil and the ex experiences and the challenge, all of that. And then just come in and switch off and start doing my own. Or switch off and just pray. Whereas it actually needs a period of preparation. So once you go into, and our Lord was very clear, he said, and when you go to pray, go into your room and close your door. There are times when we pray together. We pray in this church here. And it's a wonderful thing for us to pray together as the body of Christ. But there are times when I must go into my room, close my door and focus. As soon as you go in and close your door, <coughs> a couple of minutes just in silence. And focusing and saying, Lord, prepare my heart. Lord, prepare my mind. That's it. I, I want to stop this. That's why some of you will notice that when we're in conferences or, or retreats or things like that, that I'm speaking and there's been lots of turmoil or activity or even, you know, it's just been lots of fun, especially with the kids. I say, okay, let's just stop for a minute and reflect. And it's just that buffer that says, okay, I need to stop, I'm going into another, another phase. 
then I prepare myself for heaven. That's the first thing. The second thing is, know how long to pray for or to read for. And that's something you should determine with your confession folder or spiritual guide. Sometimes we try to do things for too long. And I, I don't have the stamina. You know, I would say to you, pray a focused prayer for 10 minutes. Read your Bible for 15 minutes. And that's enough. Until you can build up and, and build more. But that needs instruction and needs that sort of it needs that experience and that guidance. And thirdly, our life impacts directly on those things. So if my life is a mess, I must, I must expect that it's going to take me a little bit longer to actually focus on prayer, if I can focus at all. That means I need prayer even more. And I need fasting even more, I need my, my Bible even more. But sometimes I've got so much turmoil in my life, it will take longer for me to prepare myself. So, the cleaner and the more straightforward and the more transparent I keep my life, the easier these things are going to be. Thank you. 